All right, so today's topic is non-fungible tokens, NFTs, which were a very popular topic in the last two years, but its uh, popularity has ceased in the last few months. And I will talk about why this is the case. And I will also talk about NFT issues and what are the current problems, challenges, and so on. So let's first talk about blockchain use cases. Since its introduction with Bitcoin in 2009, blockchain technology created a massive hype. However, after 13 or 14 years, we have seen only a few meaningful use cases. Because so far we have seen cryptocurrencies which solved a problem that we couldn't solve before with other known techniques. We have financial applications like you know stable coins and so on, or uh, Stellar trying to combine every financial sector and so on. So we have nice. Uh, solutions, uh, but many academic papers that propose blockchain solutions are wrong or redundant. So there are many academic papers, master's thesis, and most of the time they are just concepts based on the fact that they think a blockchain is a database where when you write something, you cannot change. A data storage when something you write, you cannot change. So just based on this sentence, they write a paper or a thesis but then it turns out that if you really want to implement that blockchain in real life, you realize that its size exceeds a few petabytes in a few days. So most of these solutions are actually just ideas that doesn't work in practice. So this is the, the main reason for it is that uh, many people didn't understand the fundamentals because they didn't bother to learn the fundamentals. So this was what this course was about, okay? But once you know, once you understand this technology, actually there is a lot of things that you can do. So this is at the, we are at the point where we are still waiting the killer apps that people will do. Okay, so many things you can do, but in order to do it, you have to understand how this works. Okay, so NFT was uh, one of the uh, recent uh, things that came with blockchain, but again, there are some mistakes and the standards are not good. So I will talk about issues later. So let me uh, emphasize more that on why you do not need a blockchain because when a new technology emerges, everybody wants to use it. But actually the approach you should do is to look at it and try to understand how you can benefit from this new technology instead of using it for everything, okay? Because everybody tried to use a blockchain, every company, tried to consult me to use a blockchain, but I asked them why you want to do it. And they always say that it is a hype, so we want to do it. So it's a popular topic. But in order for you to use a blockchain, you have to answer all of these questions, yes. Okay, so uh, a blockchain might be useful if a shared and consistent data store is needed. So this is really important because a lot of companies wanted to use blockchain but they want to use a blockchain on their own data. So actually they were uh, keeping it in a secure way, in a database, and they were the only people that add data to this database. So here, what I ask is that data is contributed by more than one entity or auditing is required. In most cases, the data is added by only one entity and auditing is not required for most of the companies I'm talking about. So you don't need a blockchain in those scenarios. You can simply use a database, uh, encrypted database, distributed database, and so on and so forth, okay? So in most of the solutions people provide in academic papers or uh, thesis fails in this respect, okay? So, I mean, you might say that, okay, we can use a database, but I also want the blockchain. What is the problem with that? A uh, database will be a lot faster a lot scalable and so on and so forth, okay? Third thing is that a blockchain might be useful if records are never updated or deleted after they are written. And sensitive data will not be stored as plain text. This is uh, another misconception. People think that, you know, since crypt due to cryptocurrencies, they think that everything on the blockchain is encrypted. So I have seen many solutions where people write sensitive data, like, you know, personal information on the blockchain as a plain text because they think that everything is encrypted. So, but it is not. So you cannot use, you know, uh, you cannot write people's name with their uh, citizenship ID numbers and so on onto a blockchain, okay? Next thing is that 
and blockchain might be useful if control of the data store cannot be assigned to a single entity and tamper-proof log of all data store rights is wanted. If you, if these are, I mean, if you say yes to all of this stuff, then a blockchain might be useful. We don't say that it is, it will be better than the other methods. Okay. So this is why people couldn't come up with new ideas. Most of the time they did in the first years after the Bitcoin is to modify some basic specifications of Bitcoin to introduce alternative cryptocurrencies. Okay. But in order to create your own uh, blockchain and store different kinds of data, you have to be proficient about uh, how the blockchain works, how it is written, the blockchain, and so on and so forth. Okay. So NFTs are uh, one of the, you know, other use cases for blockchain, let's say. For instance, in Ethereum, tokens are digital assets built on top of the blockchain. Unlike Ether, which is native built in crypto, cryptocurrency of the Ethereum blockchain, tokens are implemented by specialized smart contracts. So I'm now talking about normal tokens, not NFTs. So by creating a token, you are actually building a cryptocurrency on top of another cryptocurrency. There are two types of, uh, two main types of tokens, fungible and non-fungible. All the copies of fungible tokens, usually conforming to the ERC-20 interface, are identical and interchangeable. Okay, because you are creating tokens and they are identical. Such tokens can act as a secondary currency within the ecosystem or can represent someone's stake in an investment. On the other hand, all the copies of non-fungible tokens, usually conforming to the ERC-721 interface, are unique and each token represents someone's ownership of a specific digital asset. Okay. So this was the hype. People uh, start selling digital art. And some people thought that, you know, this will be really expensive in the future. So if we become the early adopters, we will be rich, but actually they confuse cryptocurrencies with NFTs. Okay. This was the main misconception. Another thing is that the main definition of NFT on the internet, on the blogs, on the Twitter are wrong because people say that when you buy an NFT, for instance, a digital art as an NFT, they say that every pixel of this art actually written to the blockchain. So it is on the blockchain, so it will never be lost and your ownership will be recorded there for infinity. But the thing is that, yes, your ownership record is stored there, but the image is not stored there. Okay, this is one of the biggest misconceptions. Okay, so that image might be lost in the future, might be changed might be replaced, right? So while digital items such as pictures and videos are the most common assets traded as NFTs, the sale of physical assets, for example, postal stamps, gold, real estate, physical artwork, etc., is also steadily gaining popularity. An NFT is equivalent of conventional proof of purchase, such as paper invoice or an electronic receipt. So this sentence is really important. The NFT, the thing that you write to the blockchain is actually just a paper invoice equivalent, okay? You are saying that this account actually bought something and what you bought is actually written there as a URL. And in that URL, there's a JSON file, which actually uh, consists of two or three fields like name, description, and the image URL, okay? So, among other things, what make NFTs attractive are verifiability and trustless transfer. Verifiability means that sales are recorded as blockchain transactions, which makes tracking of ownership possible. The NFT concept allows for the trading of digital assets between two mutually distrusting uh, parties as both the cryptocurrency payment and the asset transfer happen automatic, atomically in a single transaction. So this is how it happens in Ethereum or Ethereum-like uh, blockchains where you have a smart contract which actually makes the transfer of the NFT ownership of it and the money transfer in a single uh, transaction. In Bitcoin, like blockchains, uh, due to limited programmability, you may need to perform more than one transaction, you know, one for the money transfer, one for the NFT transfer and so on. So several NFT marketplaces, NFTMs uh, as shortened, for example, OpenSea, Rarible, and Exe emerged in recent years to facilitate buying and selling NFTs. 
This has sparked the interest of both crypto art collectors and traders. For example, OpenSea, the largest NFTM, collected more than $236 million in platform fees generated out of a trading volume of $3.5 billion in August 2021 alone. And these are really huge numbers, as you can see. This is around half of the volume generated by the e-commerce and eBay during the same period. The all-time combined trading volume of the top three NFTMs surpassed $10 billion in September 2021. So NFTMs have surfaced as the most gas-eating Ethereum contracts. For example, OpenSea made it to the top of the list of gas gaslers in Etherscan, consuming around 20% of the gas spent by the network. Of course, Ethereum provided a few updates in the past to, you know, reduce gas fees uh, for regular transactions, but also this kind of transactions. So let's look at the N NFTs. ERC721 is by far the most popular standard for implementing non-fungible tokens on Ethereum. The standard interface defines a set of mandatory and optional API methods that a token contract needs to implement. Each NFT has its own ID to keep track of these unique tokens, which is referred to as token ID. So a digital artist may provide 10 NFTs, but all of them have different token IDs. So you buy maybe the third art or the second art and so on. All of them are different. So this is why we call them a non-fungible token. In ERC721, an operator is an entity that can manage all of an NFT owner's assets. In other words, an NFT owner can delegate the authority to act on her assets to an operator, okay? So marketplaces get this kind of ownership while you are transferring it and so on. Unlike an operator who can operate on all the assets of an owner, ERC721 defines a controller as an entity who is authorized to operate on a single asset held by an owner. An operator, controller, owner can call the transfer from method to transfer the token token ID from the current owner's from address to the to address. So this is actually how the smart contract works. When an NFT is created, the regular term is minted. The creator can optionally associate a URL with the NFT. Okay. So in regular tokens, generally you don't have URLs, but in NFTs you have a URL. That URL, called metadata URL, should point to a JSON file that conforms to the ERC721 metadata JSON schema. The JSON file stores the details of the asset, for example, its name and description, and also contains an image field storing a URL called image URL that points to the asset, okay? NFT essentially connects an asset with the record of its ownership. Given a token ID, the associated metadata URL can be retrieved by querying the token URI API of the contract. Interestingly, the creation and destruction of NFTs, minting and burning, are not a part of the standard. So it depends on the marketplace and so on. So let's see it step by step. Content creator uploads digital assets to a hosting, like a marketplace. The content creator authorizes seller to mint. Seller lists the digital asset on their marketplace. Seller fetches the digital asset from the hosting. Seller sends transactions to the smart contract on behalf of the content creator. Here we have decentralized application. Seller mints creates the NFT with the standard that they want. Buyer buys or bids, depending on how you create the smart contract. Sometimes it, is, uh, it allows bidding. Sometimes you can instantly buy and so on. Token is transferred to the buyer. This is how a transfer occurs, okay? There's also another concept called NTT, non-transferable token. NTT is created once and transferred by the creator to the owner. NTT is an NFT that cannot be retransferred. This is important because, for instance, in our case, we gave uh, diplomas and uh, Awards to students who became the uh, first in the university last year. We gave them NTTs. So it was to, you know, these NTTs were designed just for them. So they shouldn't be able to transfer the ownership of it to somebody else. This is why we created them as NTTs. 
entities can be useful for awards, certificates, and degrees, okay? Because you determine the owner and then they cannot transfer to somebody else. So when you create an NFT, again, we said that you put it to a hosting, but then where you put it? As everybody thinks, it is not on the blockchain. Think about creating you know, NFTs of digital images or videos. Generally, marketplaces limit the file size to 50 megabytes or something. But just assume that you are creating an uh, arts, which is like generally five or six megabytes if you're a high resolution image, right? Millions of people can create NFTs and writing that many images on a blockchain would not be possible, right? Also think about it in Bitcoin, we said that the block size is one megabyte. And in this scenario, we are talking about NFTs, all of them are more than five megabytes. So you cannot use a blockchain to store all of this data. So what you can do, one solution is to put it on the web and to your web page, for instance, HTTP something, and put that URL in your JSON file when you create the NFT. So this is a problem because you don't, you cannot prove that you will own that web page forever. If you don't pay your uh, fees, hosting fees, somebody can get by that domain and change your image or delete it. As a person you create, uh, who created the NFT, you can also change it. So there are, by the way, many very expensive NFTs that stays on a web page at HTTP something, which can be lost or you know change in the future. So people prefer IPFS. This is interplanetary file system. IPFS is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer permissionless file system. Anyone can join the IPFS overlay network. A data item D is assigned a unique immutable address, also known as content identifier, CID. And the content of the file changes, the CID also changes because here actually images uh, divided into pieces and every piece uh, hashed and there's a Merkle tree created from these hashes and that Merkle root actually turns into CID. So even a pixel change will change the hash value. So if you add a different picture, the CID will be different. If you add the same picture, CID will be the same, okay? All the storage elements in other the directory, the files inside the directory and the blocks within those files are stored in a directed acyclic graph structure called the Merkle DAG. IPFS maintains a distributed hash table split across all the nodes in the network to store provider records, which locate those peers that store the requested content. So you are actually volunteering to store a piece of a file. Okay, not the whole file if it is big, but only a piece of it. So think about it like a torrent, people sharing data as files. So if you stop sharing, then that image is lost. You have to re-upload it to the system. To retrieve a data item D, a node first lookups the provider's PD in the DHT, this you know, uh, distributed hash table, and then request D from the members of PD. Again, if those people stop storing those images, sharing them, then you cannot retrieve the image. And this is why many NFTs actually got lost. Out of NFT actually no longer is in the IPFS because uh, when people stop uh, downloading uh, an image from the IPFS, a file, those people who share those files stop sharing it. Okay? So they got lost. If you have the original, you can re-upload it. Uh, this is how you recovered lost NFTs. 